Gresham College presents 19th Century Mathematical Physics Peter Guthrie Tate by Dr Julia Collins Good afternoon everyone, thanks very much for the invitation to come speak at Gresham College. I've never been here before so it's really exciting to see so many people. And of the three um, people that we're talking about this afternoon, I think Peter Guthrie Tate is the one who is least well known. Put your hand up if you knew before today who Peter Guthrie Tate was. Okay, I, put your hand down if you're in the member of the BSHM. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think of the three, he's certainly the least well-known. So my job today is to tell you a bit about his life story, and in particular, the contribution that he made to the mathematical theory of knots. So at this point, I want to say the caveat that I'm not a historian, and I'm not a physicist. I don't understand the physics that Tate did. So I will be talking about his mathematics, and we can talk more about other things uh, during the break. And I also apologise to any Tate enthusiasts that there will be so many things about his life which I don't have time to fit into 45 minutes, so I apologise for that. Okay, so I realise I'm the person standing in between you and the alcoholic drinks in 45 minutes. So let me motivate this lecture um, to make you excited about what's coming up in my talk. So this is the National Library of Scotland where I started <coughs> learning about Peter Guthrie Tate. So I was, I was pointed to this repository of knowledge by another historian called Moritz Apple, and I was told that in here there was an envelope that Peter Guthrie Tate had enclosed some of his conjectures and that those conjectures had remained unopened for 100 years. And I wanted to go in there and find this envelope and find what was in there and why it was that no one had opened it. And so part of this lecture is the story of how I found the envelope and what was inside it. And at first I found, I didn't find the envelope I was looking for, I found some scribble on the back of a different envelope, which actually I was really excited by. And we'll come back to this again. So it starts off with OT, and I was assuming that you wouldn't know what that meant, but maybe you've got an idea from the previous lecture. But more excitingly is this paragraph down here. Can't you come on Monday the present at the performance? An elliptical hole gives the rings in a state of vibration. So what is this experiment that he's been invited to? Who is it that's been invited to whose experiment? That's what we're going to learn about today. So let's go back to 1876. This is the scene of this experiment. And in this lab in Edinburgh, there are two men in this room which is thick with smoke. We may make this room thick with smoke later today, if you're a good audience. The men in question are Peter Guthrie Tate and William Thompson, and what they would do in that room will change mathematical history. So, just to set the scene, it's 1867. I don't know how many people were listening carefully to the timeline in the previous talk. But we've got Maxwell, who's been developing in that decade his theory of electromagnetism, unifying electricity, magnetism and light, and dealing with kinetic theory of gases. It's been six years since Maxwell developed the first colour photograph. Thompson, just one year before, had been knighted for his laying of the transatlantic telegraph cables on this ship, the Great Eastern. So he is actually called Lord Kelvin. I would interchange William Thompson and Lord Kelvin during the talk, so don't get confused. 
Um, Darwin has published his Origin of Species only eight years previous, and Tate and Thompson in that very year have published their kind of magnum opus, their great textbook, The Treatise on Natural Philosophy, which kind of redefined what physics meant at the time. So it's 1867, and it's a really exciting time in science. And one of the big questions which are on people's minds is, what do atoms look like? No one has been able to look at one in a microscope. And there are some people who don't even believe that atoms really exist. There are all sorts of different theories going around at the time. And even for those people that do think atoms exist, there's uh, a conversation about what atoms could look like. Because suppose an atom was like a solid, hard ball like that. What is it about these little balls that would explain the different kinds of matter that we see in the universe? So how is it that an oxygen atom would look different from a nitrogen atom or an iron atom? So this is a big question which is on people's minds during this lecture, and I want to keep you to keep that question in your mind. So this lecture is going to be the story of the answer to that question of what do atoms look like, and the man, the Peter Guthrie Tate, who was the catalyst for the discoveries that were made from that point. So let's go back and start the story as it should have been started at the beginning in Dalkeith and Edinburgh, where two boys are born just a couple of months apart. Dalkeith is just 15 miles south of Edinburgh. It's a small town. This is its church. And that's where Peter Guthrie Tate was born in April. And two months later, James Clark Maxwell was born in India Street in Edinburgh. So they're born very, very close together. They both had the same kind of tragic childhood. So we've already heard Calvin lost his mother when he was six years old. Tate lost his father when he was six years old, which meant moving to Edinburgh to live with his uncle. And Maxwell lost his mother when he was eight years old as well. So they all have this kind of shared tragic childhood. But in a way, it precipitated them um, to go and learn science from somebody else. So Tate was heavily influenced by his uncle, who inspired in him a real love of natural philosophy and science. Kelvin and Maxwell both went to the same school. Sorry, Tate and Maxwell both went to the same school, Edinburgh Academy, which still exists in Edinburgh today. And they're in different year groups, despite being pretty much exactly the same age. Because Tate's family enrolled him in school quite nice and early, and so he got into the year group he should have been in. Whereas Maxwell's family were a bit behind. And by the time they tried to enrol Maxwell, the class was already completely full, and he had to go into the year above. So they were the same age, but they were in different years in school. And despite that, they met each other, and they became extremely good friends. They were kind of friendly rivals at the same time, competing to do well in their examinations. And when they were 16 years old, they both went to the University of Edinburgh to study maths and natural philosophy. Um, and their natural philosophy professor, as we've heard, was Forbes. Now, in Edinburgh at that time, the natural philosophy class was split into three divisions. So the idea was that you would enter in the third division, and as you became more knowledgeable, you would work your way up to the first division. Now, Maxwell, he was a confident young man, and he realised he was too good for the third division. So he went straight in at the second division. But Tate had to go one better, and he enrolled straight into the first division, despite, despite being told otherwise by Forbes. Forbes said, this is not a good idea, you should stick with Maxwell. And he said, no, I'm good enough, I'll be in the, the first division. And he did well. And after only a year, he was decided that he was ready to move to Cambridge and went to Peterhouse College, which is the same place had, where Kelvin had gone before, and where Maxwell would follow him just a few years later. So in 1852, this series of events has meant that Tate has become the youngest ever person to be senior wrangler in the mathematics tripos exams, which means that he got top exam marks. And he was only 20 years and eight months old. And the record that he set wasn't bettered until 1936, when a 19-year-old became senior wrangler. And of the three, he was the only person who was senior wrangler. So both Maxwell and Tate only got second wrangler. And this is a picture of Tate here on the left-hand side. Um, this is Steele, who got second place. He was another great scientist at the time. And you can already see this wonderful figure that he cuts. He's a very tall, very imposing young man, very, very confident. So based on the strength of his exam results, he became a fellow of Peterhouse College and, became, uh, and started coaching other students as part of his duties as a fellow. And his previous tutor had been Hopkins. Hopkins had coached him through his exams at the Tripos. And Hopkins had some more students that he was dealing with at that time, and one of the students was failing. And Hopkins said to the student, you know, I'm not good enough for you anymore, I can't teach you any more than I already have, you're still failing, you need to find yourself another tutor. 
And the student said, no, please, 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 keep me on. I'll work really hard. I promise not to disrupt your other students. Just let me keep being your student. Hopkins put his foot down. He said, no, you've got to find yourself another tutor. You're failing. So the student, because Tate has just got this position, so the student goes and finds Tate and asks him to do the coaching instead. And when the student got his exam results at the end of the year, he'd not only done very well for himself, but he'd actually done better than all of Hopkins' other students. <laughs> and Tate said, oh, that's nothing. I could coach a coal scuttle to be senior wrangler. <laughs> and uh, he really was a fantastic, a fantastic teacher. But at the same time, he highly valued education. And he made a vow to himself that when he moved to another institution, he would never want to implement these kind of exams that you could pass just by being coached in a certain way and not by really understanding the material. So he was, well, whilst being a good teacher, he also really didn't like this idea of coaching students to pass exams. So then there's this brief period where Maxwell and Tate both go off to other universities. So Tate goes off to Queen's College Belfast, which is a very young university at the time. It was only founded in 1845. Um, and he works with Hamilton, developing the mathematical theory of quaternions and was a champion of quaternions through his whole life. And meanwhile, Maxwell goes off and becomes a professor at the University of Aberdeen. And during this period, both of them get married and are very happy. They are, they're very happy. Don't laugh. <laughs> So, in 1859, this big event happens that Forbes um, moves on from the University of Edinburgh and his job as a professor of natural philosophy becomes vacant. Now, I was going to have this pregnant pause where we were going to have yeah, this moment where we weren't sure which one of them, James Clark Maxwell or Peter Guthrie Tate, was going to get this job um, because both of them have applied for the same position. And Maxwell's quite desperate because he's been made redundant from Aberdeen because of a merger of two colleges. But you already know who's going to get the job because Mark ruined it! <laughs> so Tate, Tate gets the job. And it's kind of surprising why he gets the job because the hiring committee at Edinburgh, they realise that Maxwell is actually the better scientist. He has developed much more original thinking. He's solved one of the big problems, which is what are the rings of Saturn made of? And um, Tate has done some good work as well, but it's not quite on the same level as Maxwell. But the reason he gets the job is because of his teaching. And even this is surprising, because the hiring committee have never seen him give a lecture. Um, but this is what they say. There is another quality which is desirable in a professor in a university like ours, and that is the power of oral <laughs> exposition proceeding on the supposition of imperfect knowledge or even total ignorance on the part of the pupils. <laughs> Certainly something we still look for in professors at Edinburgh today. So Tate gets the job, and he absolutely lives up to the expectations they have of him. He becomes a lecturing machine, with students coming from all over Scotland to be in his classes. And there are students who, who go back to his classes year on year, even though they should be moving up through the divisions. Um, there's stories of him bringing in the most wonderful demonstrations to the front of the class. He would wheel on giant magnets onto the stage. He would make sparks of electricity that filled the room. He would bring in jets of water and balance eggshells on the top of them. It was absolutely amazing, but at the same time, this focus on education, he would never do an experiment unless he believed it would have some educational value for the audience. He would never do it just because it looked amazing. Um, so absolutely wonderful lecturer, very much renowned um, for his enthusiasm at the front of the class and for the, the, the way he explained very difficult philosophical concepts. And at that time in Edinburgh, it was compulsory for students to do lateral philosophy. So anybody who was at Edinburgh in that time would have come to his classes. One of the students who was at Edinburgh at that time was J.M. Barry, who you may know as the author of Peter Pan, and this is what he says of Tate. Never, I think, can there have been a more superb demonstrator. I have his burly figure before me. The small twinkling eyes had a fascinating gleam in them. He could concentrate them until they held the object they looked at. When they flashed around the room, he seemed to have drawn a rapier. I have seen a man fall back in alarm under Tate's eyes, as though there were a dozen benches between them. But these eyes could be merry as a boy's, though, as when he turned a tube of water on students who would insist on crowding too near an experiment. <laughs> so I hope you've got this picture in your mind of this wonderful figure of Tate. He's a very tall, very imposing man. He's always wearing his big black gown, often covered in chalk. He would make a grand entrance into any room, but always with these wonderful, twinkling, mischievous eyes that you could never quite show. He's always thinking of something clever and something funny. So the students absolutely loved him, and his friends all loved him. He, he devoted a hell of a lot of time to 
lecturing his students, but at the same time he was working very hard on a whole range of physics and mathematical ideas, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today, so including quaternions, thermodynamics, thermoelectricity, kinetic theory of gases, and the big open conjecture at the time, which was about the four colour problem, none of which I'm going to talk about. And over this time, he becomes friends with William Thompson, who was his counterpart over at the University of Glasgow. And this is what Kelvin says. We never agreed to differ, we always fought it out, but it was almost as great a pleasure to fight with Tate as to agree with him. And the two of them were very good friends, and James Clark Maxwell was also a very good friend, despite having lost out on the job. And they would send each other postcards and letters all the time, filled with science, but also quotations from Greek and Latin manuscripts and little jokes that they were sharing with each other. And so Kelvin was T, T for Thompson, Tate was T prime, and James Clark Maxwell signed off as DP by DT, because if you differentiated, <laughs> <laughs> there was a particular equation in physics that if you differentiated the pressure, you got JCM, which was James Clark Maxwell. So this is how they signed all of their documents. And so this is an envelope we can tell now, because it says T here, OT, it's an envelope that Tate has sent to Thompson, so to Lord Kelvin. Um, and I don't understand the first bit of this. I don't know what he's referring to. He says, see what you've led me into. I certainly did not read his papers, but took my facts from something. So, can you come on Monday the present at the performance? An elliptical hole gives the rings in a state of vibration. And we can see the two postmarks, one from Glasgow and one from Edinburgh. So, let's go back to the lab and let's find out what this experiment was that's going to change mathematical history. So, the experiment is set up with two cardboard boxes. So, on the front of the box, they've cut a circular hole out, and on the back of the box, they've covered the open end with a towel. Now, the smoke inside it definitely is pungent. It's a mixture of ammonia solution dissolved in a dish of salt and sulfuric acid. It would have been absolutely reeking, toxic, horrible, thick fumes. Um, and Tate had experimented with lots of different uh, ingredients and recipes for the kind of smoke because to get this experiment absolutely perfect. And so this smoke was inside the box. And what he did was he would hit the towel and that would push the smoke through the circular opening at the front and they would get these wonderful smoke rings. And so if you're a very, very good audience, I do have a smoke machine and a vortex cannon. We can have a go during the break. So, these rings of smoke would emerge, and at first they would seem very violent as they had to move through the opening of the box, but very quickly they would stabilise to become these perfectly circular rings and sail silently and gracefully across to the other side of the room. And Tate described them as being like in, uh, rings of India rubber, solid India rubber. So they're extremely solid, they looked almost like, like proper physical solid, knot, uh, solid rings. And they would even do experiments like they would try to cut the smoke rings with a knife, and it was like nothing had changed. They hadn't managed to separate out the smoke or destroy the rings or anything. They had a second box as well, and Tate was able, using lots of um, practice, to get two rings to bounce off each other at the same time. So you would never get the two rings kind of merging and combining into one and becoming linked up or anything. They would, as they approached each other, they would just bounce off each other as if they really were made of rubber. And sometimes, if one of the rings was a bit smaller, it could pass through the centre of the other one. So it was really a fantastic experiment. And Kelvin, in particular, is really amazed. Partly because what Tate is trying to show him, he's trying to explain this German scientist theory, Helmholtz, about vortex lines in a fluid. So, and Helmholtz had managed to prove that when you had one of these closed vortex lines that had no beginning or end, that once it was created, it would stay in that configuration for all time. Now, in an experiment, if I was going to do this with a smoke machine, eventually the smoke rings would dissipate through the room. But if you had an ideal fluid where there was no friction or no any, anything else going on, once you had one of these vortex rings, it would stay that way forever and ever. And this gave Kelvin an idea. And I to, you've got to remember that on his brain the whole time, he wants to solve this problem about the theory of atoms and what do atoms look like. And his massive breakthrough, as he thought at the time, was that atoms could be knotted vortex rings of the ether. I have to tell you what the ether is. The ether was this fluid that was supposed to permeate the whole universe. 
Because if they believed that um, light was a wave, it had to be a wave in something. So the ether would carry the light particles or the light waves. It would carry the force of gravity. They needed to have some sort of invisible fluid in the universe that would have this function, and that was called the ether. And so Tate had this idea, so maybe each of the different elements, each of the different atoms, was a different kind of a knot, a vortex knot in the ether. Which is, it sounds like a totally crazy idea to us now, but looking back at all the different thoughts he was having around that time, it's not so surprising he came up with that. So the reason that this made sense was, well, firstly, that the ether was considered to be an ideal fluid, so we never, the, the rings would never dissipate. Secondly, it kind of solved this problem that if you had um, a continuous system, a continuous fluid permeating the universe, where do you get these hard, indivisible atoms from? And the Helmholtz's solutions to the vortex equations had shown that you would get these stable, discrete objects, even though you had a continuous fluid. So that accounted for why matter existed. And more than that, the different kinds of of knots that you could make would account for all the different elements that we would have in the world. So a piece of evidence that he found was that if you looked at the emission, spe emission spectra of different elements, so this is the, the wavelength of light which is emitted or absorbed by an atom of, a, of an element. So if you look at the lines of sodium, those two particular wavelengths that they absorb or emit. And Kelvin took this as evidence that the form of the atom would be that it was two linked rings, or two rings in some sort of linked configuration. So we've got the sort of physical evidence from the emission spectra, and we've got just the simplicity and the beauty of the theory, which made it a real candidate for a theory of atoms. And this is a, a letter that I love from Tate, uh, sorry, from, from Maxwell. Maxwell has heard about the experiment. And this particular thing, he says, um, may you both prosper and disentangle your formulae in proportion as you entangle your warbles, <laughs> which is just brilliant. Um, and he also makes the point, yeah, if you have a, just a single ring by itself, it could be that it would split off into two rings or do something funny. But as soon as you have a linkage like that, because these vortex rings are completely stable in their configurations, those two rings can never unlink themselves. They can never change their configuration, so they preserve each other's solidarity. So James Clark Maxwell is certainly in on the whole idea as well and very much supporting it. Tate is actually a bit sceptical when he first hears a theory. Like the reason he showed Kelvin this experiment was because of applications to electromagnetism. He wasn't expecting vortex theory to be applied to atomic theory. And one of his um, Scepticisms is that, well, if you look at the emission spectra of atoms, most atoms have a large number of lines in them. And so he says, well, the corresponding form of the vortex atoms cannot be regarded as very simple. What has become of all the simpler atoms? Why do we not have a greater number of elements than those already known to us? So that's his difficulty, mainly because he doesn't, yeah, he, he knows he's going to have to get started on drawing a huge amount of different knots to be able to account for all these different elements with large numbers of emission lines. But, like all of us that study knot theory, he's won over by the beauty of the subject. And he gets to work investigating the mathematical theory of knots. So his idea is he wants to make a periodic table of elements, and he's going to do that by drawing out all the different knots that he can think of and trying to match them up with the elements. So let, that moves us on to the 1870s in Edinburgh. So just to say that a mathematical knot is quite different from the knots that we encounter in everyday life when we're, like, we're tying our shoelaces. A mathematical knot has no beginning and no end. It's a completely closed loop of string. And no, nobody had ever really thought about mathematical knots before, except for these two guys. They were German mathematicians. Gauss, who is known as the prince of mathematics, and his student Listing, who's also not so well remembered. Um, but Gauss had been investigating knotted lines in relationship to um, also electromagnetism. He was trying to look at if you had um, two um, lines of wire with currents running through them, how would the magnetic fields um, change around each other? And he invented a certain integral that would calculate the number of times that a link, uh, a knot would be linked to another knot. And then his student listing was on the more abstract mathematical route, investigating the symmetries of knots. So, um, what happens if you rotate a knot? Does it stay the same, or does it, does it look different? Or perversion, as he calls mirror imaging. If you look at the knot in the mirror, does it become a different knot, or is it the same thing? 
So that's what Listing and Gauss had done. And um, in particular, there was this question that if you take the mirror image of a knot, yeah, does it stay the same or is it different? So here are two knots. They're both called the trefoil knot, the simplest of all the knots. And there's a question, are they the same knot? Can we pick one up? Can we twist it around and move it through space to look like the other one? Or are they genuinely different? And Listing conjectured that they were different, but he never had the mathematical tools to figure it out. Now, Listing and Gauss's work wasn't really um, looked at for a good 20 years after they published it. No one had found their work, no one had continued it. And so Tate got started on his own work without looking at what they had done. And he invented his own notation. So there's going to be a bit of maths now. So he would, he would label the different crossing points. A crossing point is where one bit of the knot appears to go over or under another point. And he would say, well, I can write down what that knot is by just giving you the sequence of letters that the knot follows. So if we start here at A on the over crossing, we go from A to C, then B, E, C, A, D, B, E, D, A. So he said, well, if you write down this word, that uniquely identifies what knot you thought of. And so he tried to work out this periodic table of knots systematically by going through each crossing number and writing down all the different knots with that crossing number. So that was a knot with five crossings. There are five different letters. Um, let's move on. This is a picture from one of his papers where he's investigating six crossing knots. And to begin with, he's got 80 different of these words that he's had to write down. Obviously, a lot of them represent the same knot. You can rearrange the letters on your knot and get a different word, but it'd still be the same mathematical object. Or sometimes you might have the mirror image of the knot that you first thought of. And so he's got a lot of these, these permutations which are actually the same knot. But it's a huge amount of work to narrow down these 80 different knots down to the genuinely different ones. And sometimes he finds that, that you've got a six-crossing knot which is actually made up of two three-crossing knots. So it's not indivisible, it's, it's um, made up of two smaller things. So there's all sorts of different things he's investigating when he's doing this, and noticing lots of different things as he's going about it. The first thing he notices is that you can always make the crossings go over, under, over, under. So if we take this knot, start off here, first it goes over and then under, over, under, over, under. And he says, well, if you give me any picture of a knot, I can always look at the knot from a certain point of view that the crossings go over, under, over, under. And the only time that this might not happen is when you join two of the smaller knots together and you do it in a silly way and you get two over crossings in a row. So here's an over crossing followed by another over crossing. But he said, well, you can always avoid doing that if you're a bit clever. Sometimes you get a crossing which can be removed completely without changing the structure of the knot that you're thinking of. Again, all these pictures are taken directly from Tate's paper. It's absolutely beautiful diagrams. Um, so you can see here, if you get rid of that, that crossing in the middle, you can just untwist one side of it. You've got rid of that crossing, but you've not changed that intrinsic structure of that knot. And here we have a knot which has two crossings, both of which are nugatory in his terminology. So we can get rid of both of them. So there are some crossings which are intrinsic to the knot and some which he can get rid of. And this is his first conjecture that he makes. If you have a knot where you've got the alternately over, under, over, under, and you've got none of these nugatory crossings that you can get rid of, then you have drawn your knot with the smallest possible number of crossings and you can stop right there. That's it. That's the simplest possible thing you can do. So you've got a complicated picture like this. And at first glance, you might think, well, maybe I could wiggle it around, maybe I can make it look simpler, I can get rid of some of those crossings. Actually, Tate says, no, that's already over, under, over, under, and there's no nugatory crossing, so you're done. It's the simplest possible way of drawing it. He also comes up with a way, if, if you have two different pictures of the same knot, so you're looking at it from a different direction, you can get between those two different pictures by doing a sequence of these flipping moves. And a flipe is a Scottish word, which means turning inside out. And there's no equivalent English word, so that's great. So, so if you just do a sequence of these moves, you're just moving around the crossing from one side of the knot to the other side of the knot. And you can just do a sequence of these moves and get from any diagram to any other diagram of the knots you're thinking of. And then he said, suppose that the knot is like a wall that you can walk along. Now, as you're walking along the wall, there are two different kinds of crossings you might encounter. It could be that you walk along the top of the wall from left to right and from the underneath, from right to left, 
and I'm going to call that a positive crossing. And if you walk on the top one from right to left and from the underneath from left to right, we're going to call that negative. So there's two different kinds of crossings that you can get. And he was trying to look at knots, like how can you tell when a knot is the same as its mirror image? And this is a conjecture he came up with. If you have equal numbers of positive crossings and negative crossings, then you will have an amphichiral knot well, that means its own, its own mirror image. This idea that if you, if you looked at the knot in the mirror, all the positive crossings would become negative and all the negatives would become positive. So they have to balance each other out for you to, to have this kind of symmetry. And in particular, this implies that the amphichiral knots must have an even number of crossings. Otherwise, the balance of positive and negative wouldn't be quite right. So he's got all these wonderful ideas that has helped him to classify these knots. And he writes down these ideas and puts it into the envelope. And the eagle-eyed among you will notice that I've, I've destroyed part of the envelope, and we'll see what's underneath there in a bit. But you can see he's written on here, to be preserved. And he hands it into the Royal Society of Edinburgh, where it is kept for over 100 years without being opened. And this is what I found this. This is an actual picture of the, the envelope that I found when I went to the National Library of Scotland. So you can go there and you can find it, and it's very exciting. It's like doing real history. <laughs> Which is, I just do maths, so this is really exciting for me. Um, so using these conjectures, he was then able to do all the seven crossings. And so we saw with six crossings, there were 80 different words he had to play around with. With seven crossings, there were 579 words. And the number of words he would have to look at grows exponentially as the number of crossings increases. So I think at, um, at eight crossings, you're at about four or 5,000 words. And at nine crossings, you're at 40,000 words. Um, but this is seven crossings, and this is also a page from one of his papers where he's drawn them all out, um, and his wonderful title, The First Seven Orders of Naughtiness. Um, and it's just a zoom-in picture. You can see that he's, he's got a bit lazy. He's not bothered drawing the over and the under crossings, but that's because they're all alternating. So as soon as you specify one particular crossing, all the other ones follow immediately, and the only ambiguity is whether you've got the knot or whether you've got its mirror image. But he's also written down which of the knots are amphichiral, which of the knots are their own mirror images. So he's got this complete classification of seven crossing knots there. So he publishes this at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So it's not like he keeps it secret, it's just in his envelope and nowhere else. This is published in professional journals at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And he genuinely believes that he is on the road to finding this theory of atoms and this periodic table of knots which are going to match up exactly with the real periodic table which had just been um, published also in 1869 by Mendeleev. So these, all these things are happening at the same time. But of course, he, he's so busy teaching and doing other sciences as well, he doesn't have time to deal with all the different knots. So he advertises for help. And help comes in the form of these two men. There's Reverend Kirkman, who is, uh, lives down in Lancashire, and Charles Little, who is an engineer over in the United States of America. And both of them help him to write out all the different words of the knots and decide which ones are the same. And they make um, tables of up to 10 crossings. And with only these conjectures and the power of the intuition that Tate had, they managed to do this without making a single mistake. And the tables that they made then in the 1870s are still the tables that knot theorists use today, and we still use the same notation and the same classification that they made up then, which I think is absolutely amazing. So let's fast forward, because I'm going to run out of time soon. So to 100 years later. And as you know, it's very sad, but the vortex theory of atoms was nonsense. In 1887, Michelson and Morley had done an experiment that completely disproved the existence of the ether. So without the ether, there could be no knotted vortex atoms at all. And, but despite this, the, the knot theory was so beautiful that it got taken on a life of its own and it became part of mathematics and part of this theory of topology. Um, and in those hundred years when knot theory is being developed all around the world, nobody had still been able to prove whether the conjectures that Tate made and put in that envelope, whether they were right or whether they were wrong. There were no counterexamples to show he'd made a mistake, but no one had found a proof either. And we have to wait until 1984, so more than a hundred years before the breakthrough happens. And it happens on the other side of the world. There's a man called Vaughan Jones who wins the Fields Medal, which is like the Nobel Prize in mathematics for inventing this object called the Jones polynomial. 
Now, the problem that Tate had had when he was trying to classify his knots was that he was trying to look at these positive and the negative crossings, but they were all getting in the muddle with the nugatory crossings because you could add in these extra crossings that didn't change the knot, and you were adding in pluses or minuses into your crossings, but you hadn't changed the knot. So that was the problem, and the Jones polynomial eliminated that ambiguity. So it managed to, to work out that if you, if you added in a new crossing, you also added in either a plus or a minus, and there was some clever way it had of negating those two things against each other, so that you didn't have to worry about whether you'd found all the nugatory crossings. You could just calculate this polynomial, and um, it would give you an object that you could identify your knot with. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what the Jones polynomial is, um, but happy to talk about it in the break. But anyway, so 1984, this mathematical object was created, which managed to elim eliminate Tate's ambiguities. And it was only in 1987, so still another three years, before the conjectures were approved, and by three guys, Kaufman, Murasugi, and Thistlethwaite. So these are the three conjectures again. So firstly, if you have an alternating diagram which has no nugatory crossings, then it's the smallest possible way of drawing your knot. That was proved. If you have an alternating knot and the pluses and minuses of the crossings balance each other out and add up to zero, then your knot is its own mirror image, or its amphichiral. And finally, if you have an amphichiral knot, it must have an even number of crossings. So Tate was completely vindicated. These were all turned out to be true. And it just so happens that in 1987, the envelope was opened by a complete coincidence. Like nobody had thought, ah, someone's proved his conjectures, we may as well open that envelope. No. They just opened it because they found it in a box somewhere and they didn't know what it was. And the archivist has written on it in biro <laughs> of the date that she's opened it. And oh my God. Um, so that, that was opened in 1987, just magically coincident with the, the year that Tate's conjectures were proved. So what's inside the envelope? Not very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of an anticlimax. <laughs> There's this one sheet of paper which refers to Tate's theory of knots. And th the beginning of it is just setting stuff up. And right at the bottom, we've got here, it says if the simplest is plus, minus, plus, minus, then it's irreducible, which means you can't draw it any smaller. So it's almost like a scribble that he wrote at the end of the day and stuffed it into an envelope. It's not even taken the time to write it out in a clear mathematical sense. He's not given any kind of proof or argument for what he's done. And that's the only conjecture which is in the envelope. So I am totally baffled as to why he did this. And I think at that time there was an idea that you could assert priority for mathematical discoveries by putting things in an envelope and getting the postmark because it has a, a date stamp on it. But given that he also published all of his stuff in journals and that nobody else in the world was working on this at the same time, it does seem a bit weird. So if anyone can shed any light on this, I would love to hear from you. Um, this is the, the only other thing that I found in the envelope was this bit of paper, which I have no idea what is on it. There are various integrals and differentiations, and it doesn't seem to relate to knot theory at all. So why it was in the envelope, again, I have no idea. And I'm happy to talk about this and show people who want to know about this later on. And the final conjecture was improved in 1991, the Flyping Conjecture. But Tate's intuition only went so far. He never realised that you could have non-alternating prime knots, knots which were not decomposable into two smaller things. And so there are counterexamples to his conjectures. So here are two knots which are the same knot, but they're not related by a series of flypes. And if you look at the positive and the negative crossings, they have a different balance of them, each of them. And because they're non-alternating, they, they're not covered by Tate's conjectures. More interestingly, only in 1998, somebody managed to find an, an amphichiral knot with an odd number of crossings. This is a 15-crossing amphichiral knot. And it's because it's non-alternating that you can't do the pluses and minus thing. And as far as I know, this is the only non alternating odd crossing number amphichiral knot that we've ever found. So it's actually not so surprising that Tate never found it because they're very, very rare. <laughs> and we 
as not theorists today, are still struggling with the same questions that Tate struggles with. We, we don't have an answer for how can you decide whether a knot is its own mirror image. With the, there's no number we can calculate, there's no objects that we can cook up that will always tell you whether or not a knot is its mirror image. And more than that, how can you tell when you have two diagrams of the same knot? That's still an open question. We still haven't found an algorithm for doing that. And we do have knot tables today with up to 22 crossings, of which there are 6 billion. Um, and of course, we can only do that now with the help of computers. And even the 11 crossing knots were only completed in 1969 by John Conway. So it's absolutely amazing that Tate got as far as he did just with the help of two friends and some pen and paper. And I did want to show you that knots are once again being used in science. So coming back to Edinburgh, we've got this wonderful trefoil molecule. So it's, it's a, a molecular knot um, that was made in 1989, and we've only managed to make one other knot since then, the pentafoil knot, which was only made last year. So, and this is, it goes back to this question of how can you tell when you've got the mirror image of a knot? If you have two drugs, and one is the left-handed molecule and one is the right-handed molecule, you need to have some method of telling whether or not they're the same. So it's an absolutely fundamental question. The DNA in your body is sometimes knotted, and you have special enzymes in your body that help to untangle and unknot the DNA, and biologists are having to work with knot theorists to understand that process. And what I think is exciting is what Mark mentioned as well, that in string theory today, we're back to this idea that particles are actually one-dimensional bits of string. So it really has come full circle from the knotted vortex atoms back to string theory. Tate resigned his chair only at the age of 70, and he had taught 9,000 pupils at the University of Edinburgh. He taught the sons of the people who originally came there. And he was always, he still is renowned as being one of the best lecturers we've ever had. And died just a few months later on 4th of July. And there were a few heartfelt obituary notices I just want to show you. In his lovable simplicity and warmth of heart, one sometimes forgot his great gifts of intellect. He's not a man that we still remember today, despite the wonderful things that he did. It, he did a lot of science as well as this mathematics as well. Um, but he was also a wonderful, generous man. And there was to the last a delightful boyishness of heart, such as is assuredly a precious thing to possess. He never lost those twinkling eyes and that mischievous sense of humour. <laughs> So I hope that we don't forget who Tate is today, because he was a great scientist and a mathematician in his own right. He pretty much founded this whole area of knot theory. But he was also the catalyst for Kelvin and Maxwell to develop a lot of their theories. And a lot of the, the knot theory that he did, he worked with Maxwell of translating that into theories of electromagnetism. So let's not forget Tate. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.